Well, hello. This is unusual in that I am making the introductions today, Alexander Mercurius. I have uh, my co-host and friend and colleague um, on many programs, Professor Glenn Deason of Oslo University, person with much experience of international relations, a person with great scholarship and experience and uh, skill in scholarship. And this is going to be an, a, a different program in some ways from some of the programs that we've been doing recently in that it is actually a discussion between the two of us. And the reason we are having this discussion is because Professor Deason has written and it's just been published and it can be found on Amazon um, and in other places, a book, a new book, and it is about the Ukraine war and the new Eurasian world order. And I have been reading the book with tremendous interest over the last couple of days. I should say that I found it a page turner. I found it difficult to put it down. Um, it is absolutely gripping, and it is different from every other book I have read about the conflict in Ukraine. Most books that I know about the conflict in Ukraine focus specifically on Ukraine. They talk about Ukraine itself, about its divisions, about the factions there, about the internal conflicts, about the history, the relationship with Russia, the involvement of the West, the diplomacy, all of those things. You find all of that also, by the way, in Professor Deason's book. But what makes it unique, what makes it absolutely fascinating, is that Glenn has explained all of that, put that all in the context of the development of international relations today, the change in the shape of international relations. And the way that this conflict has arisen cannot be understood, and that's absolutely clear from this book, without an understanding in the development of international relations. And the key, the clue to that, is in the title, when which refers to the emergent, to the new Eurasian world order. Now, the first part of the book, which I found very interesting, is about different concepts of world orders, the hegemonic system, which we've had in the West. Lots explained there, a hegemonic system that predates the specific hegemony of the United States, and which basically goes back to the 16th century. The conflicts that this has given rise to, the way this system has worked within Europe itself, and it's a hegemonic system of Europe and the West over the rest of the world, but internally within Europe. And this is, I think, extremely insightful and very new. We had a system that was different, a system of sovereign states balancing each other uh, for most of this time, um, a system which is defined as the Westphalian system based on concepts of state sovereignty developed at the time of the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. But specifically, this is a European system. As far as the rest of the world is concerned, it's a system of European hegemony. And then in the 19th century, that system evolves into a system of hegemony first by Britain. And then in the 20th century, of course, Britain as the hegemon is replaced ultimately by the United States, but with all sorts of other complicated things working out as well with the period of the conflict, the Cold War, the balance between the two superpowers of that era, the Soviet Union and the United States. And the key thing to understand is that Western policy towards Russia, Western policy connected to Ukraine, is deeply informed by this long history of European, then British, well, specifically British, and specifically American hegemony, and the kind of attitudes and concepts that this gave rise to, 
and also um, the fear that exists now that this period of hegemony, Western hegemony and American hegemony, which are, of course, interconnected, but they're not exactly the same thing, is now ending. And Professor Deason also discusses the role of liberalism in this system, the way that liberalism itself has evolved as part of that system and how liberalism has to some extent acted as the justification for this period of hegemony and the fear that is also occasioning in the West that as Western hegemony recedes and American hegemony recedes, liberalism, which informs much of the conception the West today has of itself, might start to recede also. And then, of course, we have the rise of the new powers, the development of the multipolar system, which is a system, a kind of Westphalian balance of power system, in which the West is only a part, and then we have the crucial role of Russia within it, the fact that it's never been a fully easy part of the European Westphalian system, and of course it's never been a part of the collective West for many reasons which we'll be discussing more deeply in this programme. And the, see, the key conflict, the one that defines the change, explains the change, is the one in Ukraine. And of course, as I said, the book does actually go into a great deal of detail about the conflict in Ukraine itself. So it's a book which, in my opinion, doesn't just explain the conflict. It, it explains why we are where we are and the whole nature of the modern world. So first, Glenn, is this a reasonably accurate summary of your book? I don't pretend that it covers all the points. No, I thought that, that was like... <laughs> that, that is this, is this, does this generally get the overall gist of it? Yeah, that is the, the the essence of the book because, uh, uh, well, I wouldn't say, well, sometimes it's said that this war in Ukraine isn't um, necessarily all about Ukraine. Uh, some say it's not about Ukraine at all, which probably wouldn't be correct. Uh, but obviously it's a symptom of something much larger if we see how much uh, each side is willing to invest into this and the amount of risks both sides are willing to take. So this is... Uh, uh, and also, you, you get it from some of the citations I use in the book, where uh, both sides tend to lean in and refer to this as uh, like um, an inflection point in world order. Which direction are we going? And uh, I think that's what makes this so dangerous. We we are in a vacuum at the moment. Uh, with this, there is no longer unipolarity, but multipolarity has not yet cemented itself. So you see now. Uh, the different great powers uh, pulling the world in opposite directions. And the problem, of course, is uh, world order is about how states engage with each other. And in the absence of world or, or common rules, there's uh, more or less uh, yeah, more vicious anarchy. And I think that's also something that's uh, uh, yeah, describing what we're going through now. But uh, but I like what you said about justification as well, because this is, uh, yeah, I wanted to, well, then what, what does world order depend upon? And uh, it's um, you, you tend to see it's an international distribution of power uh, and the legitimacy of the rules. And this is uh, these two variables is really what dictates how states should engage with it with each other. So uh, obviously, in the past, uh, under the you know Holy Roman Empire, if you had one center of power and also uh, the universalism. Uh, of Christianity or Catholicism, then you have also uh, yeah, the universal ideals to support uh, hegemony. And uh, But of course, as you, you mentioned Westphalia, this is really, in 1648, this is really considered to be uh, the, the birth of the modern world order, in which uh, we all, the, all the major powers in Europe began to fight each other. They all realized there can't be a hegemon winning at the end of this. So and and the, the, to a large extent, it was started by uh, yeah reformation and uh, the, uh, the 
the absence of uh, the same universal ideals. So you want a balance of power. So all the states, you can't have one state attempting to dominate. So they all check each other. And at the same time, you you want to accommodate the uh, religious or cultural or civilizational distinctiveness of each one. And this is um, this has been yeah, the foundation, uh, which is why hegemony represents a challenge. And we see some of the same patterns in the U.S. hegemon or the collective West, uh, in which uh, there's an effort to centralize power again, to have one center of power. But we also see that it also revives universal ideals. And uh, so when we talk about uh, uh, liberal democracy, human rights, uh, it's it's not that these ideals are bad. Uh, on the contrary, I would be a big supporter. Uh, but but the problem is the the claim for universalism uh, suggests that uh, uh, that it diminishes the the principle of sovereign equality, which is so foundational mm-hmm. in uh, the modern world order. And you can see the UN Charter as a reflection of uh, the Westphalian order reflects this. But now mm-hmm. we have a system of sovereign inequality, so no one. Uh, well, thinks twice if uh, the West shouldn't uh, interfere in the domestic affairs of other countries to promote democracy or protect human rights. This is the most natural thing. And of course, power interests uh, unavoidably comes into this. And um, and, uh, and 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 this uh, this uh, this legitimizes and substantiates hegemon, hegemony. And I think that's why you see now this has been a breakdown over the past few years. Uh, the hegemon is gone in terms of military power, uh, economic, institutional, and uh, information across the board. And at the same time, you then see the rules of international law beginning to change as well. So the countries who are for the Westphalian system, they call for international law in accordance with the UN system. The hegemon, uh, advocates for hegemony are talking about the rules-based international order, which is based on sovereign inequality. So this is really um, yeah, the framework which I put this whole conflict uh, within. Yes, and what is so interesting is, again, it's, it's, it's very historically grounded, which is, I think, absolutely essential. If you don't understand the history, then you don't understand anything. This is always my take to international relations. So this, this, this constant temptation that exists in the West towards universalism. And um, now I should... I should just disclose here that, you know, way back, long, long ago, when I was a student of history, one of my big topics, wrote a big essays about this, was the on the origins of the Thirty Years' War. And in fact, it's exactly what you said. It was the, the, the Habsburgs, who were the dominant power in Europe at that time, and who were, of course, also the representatives of the Catholic Church, had very, very much a drive towards universalism and in fact they had this um this the this it was a sort of mysterious sort of slogan but it was a series of letters a e i o u which is austria erit in orbe ultima this was their sort of you know their motto if you like austria will be supreme in the world. <laughs> it was a very much a universal idea. So that there would be one emperor, one faith, one uh, line of control. Habsburgs controlled Spain. They controlled much of Germany. And in the 1620s, they made this massive push to consolidate it all and to bring it all together. And they did it at precisely that moment when they sensed that they were starting to decline because um, Spanish power was fading and that had been the core region. So this was their last big throw. And of course the result was a disaster and the 30 years war was a catastrophe and it went on for 30 years and there was a huge amount of death and destruction. And out of it, ultimately, a multipolar system in Europe emerged and that was the birth of diplomacy, much of the concept of diplomacy that we have today developed then. And this is where I found the most interesting part of your, the first part of your book, is that you were talking about how multipolar systems 
which in a kind of a sense, Westphalia in terms of Europe actually was, are systems where there are rules, there is actual law, there's concepts of law, there's diplomacy, there's a desire on the part of the powers, the various states, that they want to maintain a balance so that nobody will be overwhelmed and absorbed by the others, that they will each have their security. And that security, by the way, also extends to protection of their internal sovereignty, their ability to run their own affairs without the interference of the other, which is, of course, exactly what the universal empire hadn't wanted. And there you have it, right at the beginning of our modern world, the early modern period, we see the same tensions that we see today. And uh, of course, the world changed a lot since uh, 1648. So, uh, as you mentioned, there has been disruptions in which uh, the world order had to adjust. So, uh, liberalism, for example, uh, especially the political liberalism with the French and uh, the American Revolution at the end of the 18th century. This uh, they did this in introduced to universalist concepts, uh, which was a disruption as well, which had to be accommodated. So, uh, so again, there was some needs to. Uh, so to make alterations, you also had the uh, industrial revolution emerging, in which power politics was more uh, became less about only military force, but then also looking at the uh, economic aspects. So um, initially, we have a very focus on liberal economics. We assume that uh, if two countries trade together, then this is an absolute gain. Now there will be peace. But in reality, you see it's about relative gain. You know, if you can skew the symmetry of dependence, make the other one more dependent on you than the other way around, then uh, this becomes a way uh, of sourcing power, both economic and political. So you see this becomes also an instrument in restoring uh, an equilibrium into the system. And I think this is why you also see uh, the fierce competition of, between the United States and China, for example, is not really uh, military at the core. It's uh, it's a competition over who dominates the key industries, uh, who uh, who has the uh, most competitive uh, technologies, uh, who has the main transportation corridors under their uh, control, uh, who has the main banks, which currencies are you using. These are the main uh, issues which uh, they're competing over. Now, I think one... When the United States is at a disadvantage as a military power, it has uh, interest in in um, uh, benefiting from this position. So you see uh, yeah, the militarization of the rivalry taking place as the Americans are chipping away at the sovereignty of China by uh, pushing for the secession of Taiwan, for example. But um, no, o overall, I, I, it's... Um, it's an interesting uh, framework to look at, to, to look at world order because, as you said, I think one of the things really missing in uh, international relations is history. In the past, uh, all the uh, political scientists have uh, at least a degree in history. This is more or less gone now. We're living kind of in a vacuum where everything is about the present, and that creates a big problem. Because if, as I also wrote about, uh, a lot of the challenges we have today about the hegemon and the decline of hegemony it's uh, we already did all of this in the 19th century with with britain you know they had their liberal liberal empire they linked the uh, ideals of uh, liberalism to empire and we to a large extent have the same today so in the west we really consider hegemony to be a necessity because this allows uh, liberalism to be elevated but for the rest of the world obviously they don't do not see it in this way and one of the most interesting things about 19th century uh, period, where, as you correctly say, the British exercised a hegemonism, which had some a lot of similarities to that of the United States in the you know the 20th century and 21st century, is that it provoked responses, it provoked res resistance from those countries which were in a position to resist, and it, that resistance was economic. It took the form of particular ideas about how to organise economies. So the British wanted to integrate everybody into their own system, which worked to consolidate their hegemonic position. That is what free trade ultimately was all about. And yet countries that didn't want to be controlled by the British in that kind of way, like the United States and Germany, developed 
their economies in ways that rejected free trade. And you have the American system that is developed in the 19th century by Alexander Ham Hamilton. You have the lists, the ideas of Friedrich List, which gained traction in Germany, especially in Bismarck's time. And of course, List's ideas also take hold, take root in Russia, which one suspects the British saw as the biggest adversary of them all. And the response from the British is very similar to the one that we see from the United States today, which is to try to create conflicts, to try to block the Russians, for example, with conflicts in the Far East with Japan, to try to block the Russians in the Black Sea with the Ottomans, with the Crimean War, and essentially, again, divide and rule. Well, it's uh, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot of similarities because also at that point, uh, you also had this uh, Eurasian, the uh, uh, Eurasian uh, dimension of uh, world order because this was a new thing being introduced. Because uh, prior to this, uh, whoever dominated the seas, they would have the benefit of uh, allowing themselves to become reliant on more free trade. They would, you know, control the transportation corridors. They that are uh, great benefits, and then suddenly. Uh, as uh, Mackinder and others worried greatly about, uh, uh, the Russians were suddenly connecting Eurasia by by land, and this was especially the case after its humiliating defeat at the Crimean War, uh, which ended then in '56 when they began to push through, and first, of course, pushing down towards Afghanistan, and then you had this conflict between the British and the, the Russians, and they also pushed towards uh, Asia, uh, you know, where they reached all the way down to Port Arthur, and uh, again also being pushed back, uh, having this pushback from the British. So to a large extent, this was the rivalry. What is also interesting is in uh, on the periphery of this, of course, you have the rise of new power. So while the British and uh, Russians were locking horns on the side, you had the emergence of the Americans, the Germans, and, and other key powers. So uh, no, there is, um, there, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of similarities. And as you mentioned also how uh, how one would attempt to block the Russians then by access to the sea. This is also something that has uh, yeah, gone through the centuries. The Swedes did it uh, back in the uh, was it the, yeah, the 17th century. And um, the British always done it and then followed by the Americans. And if you look at the strategy, uh, again, why we had the Crimean War in the mid-19th century is to uh, keep the Russians out of the Black Sea pushed them back, also preventing them from accessing the Mediterranean. Look look where, where we are today. Uh, the former NATO Secretary General Rasmus was very openly saying, well, now we can make the Baltic Sea our NATO lake. The Americans are pushing their military bases up in uh, Scandinavia, so they will have greater influence over the Arctic. And, of course, uh, the Ukraine war, which is to a large extent also about the Black Sea. So these are the main three seas which Russia access the yeah the Europe, so the Arctic, the Baltic, and the Black Sea, and all of these are now um, have been increasingly put under uh, the collective West or American control since the end of the Cold War. So, but uh, one thing that's very different because uh, everyone who focuses on the Eurasianism of the 19th century or the 20th, for that sake, uh, it's the Russians were aspiring for hegemony, but no one in Russia today. You know, they has either capability or intention to do so. Now they see uh, Eurasia not as a hegemonic project, but as a multipolar project, uh, very much a Westphalian project, in which they need the cooperation of uh, China, India, Iran, all of these former giants. And this is, uh, yeah, a very cost creates a very different form of uh, um, network across Eurasia. Because in the past, when the Russians had deep interest only in integrating with the West uh, after the Cold War, all the relationships with the Chinese, the Iranians, all of this could be merely to elevate their market value to the Europeans, something they could do negotiate their entry into Europe to create a greater Europe. Those days are gone. So there's uh, there's something very different uh, coming. This uh, Again, which is why I called it the Eurasian world order as well. Absolutely. And can I just say, very interestingly, Putin in his State of the Nation address, the one that he's just delivered to the Duma, 
after the Russian, well, the Federal Assembly in Moscow, he actually talked about a Eurasian security architecture. So he's no longer talking about, you know, Europe, a European security architecture, which has to be, if there's going to be a negotiation, that has to be a negotiated matter. It's got to be a Eurasian security architecture. So the Russians are talking about security architectures that encompass India, China, Iran, Turkey, places which are completely outside the framework of international relations that the Western powers are used to, which essentially was themselves. And that is one of the most interesting things, actually, because the Russians are having, you know, sort of tip, put their toe into this dip their toe into this idea of Eurasianism in the 19th century, have suddenly embraced it now that they've managed to make the conceptual leap and say, look, it's not the West. So it's, just, it's not just a small group of European states and the United States that really matter. The world is completely different. All sorts of other countries have emerged civilizations have emerged, resurfaced, and it's a multinational system that is much greater than the West. I think the West finds that a shocking idea. And again, one of the most interesting things, parts of the book, for me, was the way in which you discuss the hierarchies, the sense that the West has, that, that you know, liberalism, the fact liberalism makes them superior that there's something superior about them that they have the knowledge of how things should be that you know they own democracy they own liberalism they know what the correct way forward is and their job is to sort of civilize everybody and teach everybody what that thing is and suddenly they find that in fact the people who they thought are their pupils have grown up and don't want to listen to these lessons anymore. The Russians have understood that. The West can't get his mind around it, or so it seems to me. Uh, yeah, no, I think very much so. And I, in this Putin speech, was also uh, I noticed the same argument as well, where he really highlighted that the BRICS has become the expanded BRICS have become much larger now than uh, the G7. I think it was in terms of GDP, uh, well, according to purchasing power parity, I think it's thirty eight. Uh, percent are non bricks versus the twenty seventh of uh, percent of uh, the G seven. So this is uh, this is well, you know, it's not just showing off, but it's pointing out that the world is not different. The main countries who claim the right for collective hegemony in the world, he's saying, you know, you're a minority now. This is uh, we're not going to be ruled uh, ruled by you anymore. And I think this is uh, this is uh, um, a symbol also of world order because these are the key institutions which will govern the, the world and these are the ones who will set the actual rules. And uh, in, within these institutions, of course, it's uh, when he refers to the economic power, this is a reference to the international distribution of power. So you have that one variable. And then next to it, you will also have the legitimacy of how to rule. And I think on this legitimacy, there's uh, something very different because um, when you have hegemony, you will have uh, demand sovereign in inequality. Uh, when they talk about so uh, multipolarity, what they're saying is that this is expressed in the language of sovereign equality. So this is why the Chinese have this global civilizational initiative where they say, listen, we we have uh, all these different paths to development. One civilization shouldn't dictate to another how to develop. So this is, uh, this is essentially a call for sovereign equality. This is rejecting universalism. Uh, so of course a challenge for this, uh, if you know, if the West we want to engage with this, accept the multipolarities here, uh, we we would have to find this balance between accepting that you know we we want to preserve some of the ideals of a liberal democracy, but we also have to uh, recognize uh, how this influence world order that the rest of the world is not going to put up with any sovereign inequality anymore. So it's on this basis that they're pushing back against this universalism. Um, but in terms of this, uh, uh, you know, sorry, it's just you, you also mentioned how we want to, uh, how the diplomacy is shaped by this, that we want to, you know, we want to teach the world. And now our little students are all grown up and they don't want to be ruled by us anymore. This is also very much um, 
a continuation, if you will, of the 19th century, because we did the exact same thing then as well. We said, well, we are very civilized people. Now we talk about liberal democracies versus authoritarianism. But then it was, uh, uh, you know, the civilized versus the barbarians. This is when you have people like Kipling coming with this analogy of the jungle versus the garden. So once you, when you're in the garden, which is the West where we have civilization, you can have rules. You have um, you can have uh, yeah the rule of law. You respect sovereign equality. All, all of these uh, wonderful things. However, when we're outside the garden among the barbarians, then the rules have to be tossed away. Now it's the uh, yeah the law of the jungle, and uh, you know we have to act. How what what is necessary to do in order to prevent the the jungle from invading the, our beautiful garden, and this was uh, the foundation of the civilizing mission or white man's burden, and we we, we see the same rhetoric <laughs> coming forward again. Indeed, um, the advisor I cited as well of uh, Tony Blair, who was Tony Blair very openly rejected Westphalian idea. He called for a new world order, and this was. Uh, this was, a, you know, his advisor even wrote a book about this, where he called for liberal empire. So very much taking the same ideas from the 19th century. But again, this is not a peripheral. Uh, I think everyone was familiar with uh, Josef Borrell, the, uh, the foreign policy chief of the EU. He used the same exact same language. They said, you know, we are we built a beautiful garden here. Outside the garden is a jungle. If we don't go out in the jungle and tame it, the jungle will invade our garden. So it's not just our response, uh, right to go outside and civilize the world. It's our responsibility. And uh, this is uh, this this mentality and this idea of sovereign inequality, which really dominates a lot of the foreign policy thinking. And it's not just in Africa and Asia and South America. This is uh, to a large extent how uh, how they think of. Uh, civilizing Ukraine for that sake, because whenever they talk about Ukraine as democratizing it, they never actually talk about the popular will of Ukrainians. Mm. Uh, and that was, you know, some of the statistics you show from 91 to 2014, only like 20% of them actually want to join NATO. Most of them preferred relations with uh, Russia. So how can we, um, so how can we justify them joining NATO through a coup, which they didn't even support. And this is the main idea. This is, uh, they, they don't necessarily know what they want, but uh, we will democratize them uh, and we will, you know, make them uh, civilized. And it's not what democracy is. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's important that we are the teacher. And this is, um, this has also been a very difficult relationship we always had with Russia because we say, listen, we are, you're the Asians, we are the Europeans, you know, we are the civilization, you're barbarians, now we're liberal democracies, you're authoritarian. The only relation we can have is a teacher and a student. So you can you can either accept this subordinated role in uh, which we divide between yeah, the subject and object and accept the implied uh, sovereign inequality, or if you don't want this subordinated role, where you don't have a seat at the table, but you do as you're told, well, then you hate democracy. You're an enemy of civilization. And then we have to balance you. Then we have to check you. And this has been NATO's rhetoric towards uh, Russia since the 90s. We're going to roll up on your borders, but don't worry. We're a peaceful bunch of democracies. We just want the rule of law. However, if you resist us, you know, this this expansion will be used to contain you. So we're, we're talking <laughs> out both sides of our mouth. So, yeah. Uh, your chapter on Ukraine is astonishing, and it, what it shows to me is how, in you know, adopting the cause of building up democracy and liberalism in Ukraine, um, the West has in effect destroyed democracy and what used to be considered liberalism in the West. I mean, what it, what liberalism that was in Ukraine has been destroyed there also. I mean, we now have a, a, an incredible dominance within Ukraine of extreme right fascist groups. Uh, um, and, you know, whatever they are, they are absolutely not liberals. But we support them. We support them because somehow or other that it helps us to achieve our greater purpose which is to establish democracy and liberalism in Ukraine. It, it, it is it is astonishing, actually, to see how um, you know this this kind of rhetoric. And I think this this I mean, obviously, there's a great deal of cynicism here as well. But beneath the, the cynicism, there is an actual bedrock of belief. Uh, I, I think one of the things points you again make is that at some level, 
these people really do believe that they're doing good. <laughs> they really believe that they are defending and promoting liberalism, even as they act to destroy it. So if an election throws up the wrong candidate, well, that's not really a good election. You try and, uh, you know, defeat it. You're, you're fully in favour of free expression, provided, of course, that free expression isn't abused, as you would say, by the wrong people. It, it, it is very strange and very twisted, but it is absolutely part of this idea of subordination, that they have to be the, the pupil, we have to be the teacher. And there's never any point, I suspect, where that relationship will change, because from a Western point of view, what they're doing in Ukraine will mean that it will never become the kind of democracy and uh, liberal place that they say they want. No, I think uh, I, I very much agree that uh, we did uh, dismantle uh, the democracy in in Ukraine, and uh, and I think it's it's. Um, it's because it didn't fit the right model. I mean, when you have countries like Poland, you know, they were always quite uh, resentful towards uh, the, the Russians. When the Cold War was over, they, instead of removing the dividing lines, they preferred just uh, moving them towards the east. So they were on the right side of a new dividing line. This was very much preferential, which is why they lobbied hard for for um, for uh, for NATO expansion to be part of the Western bloc instead of dismantling the bloc system. Uh but with, with Ukraine, it's been very different there because with the polls, you can set conditions. You know, you want to join the EU and NATO, here's the conditions you have to fulfill. And it becomes, uh, you know, political conditionality. With Ukrainians, it was very different. It's, uh, I, I, work with a, I worked a bit with a Ukrainian um, a PhD student, and, you know, she looked into this, how, how NATO was socializing Ukraine, uh, essentially um, re-educating them about why why NATO is not a threat. It's actually you need us because if you don't have the Russian threat, then you don't want to join NATO. And if you don't want to join NATO, then we don't have the incentive to socialize you. So they they had to de-Russify and essentially had all these programs to cause divisions. And I think this is a... Uh, this was the main problem because uh, Ukraine is, uh, like everyone agreed, which we're not allowed to say anymore, this was a fact that Ukraine was very much divided. So in the, you know, you don't want to oversimplify, but in the Western part, they saw, saw Ukraine as being, you know, you had one ethnicity, one language, one culture, but over hundreds of years, mm -hmm. the Russians had, uh, their imperialism had uh, uh, deeply rooted themselves in, in Ukraine. So nation building really meant you had to shed and de-Russify. Uh, get rid of uh, this uh, this Russian uh, imperial relic, uh, but in the eastern parts of Ukraine, they look at this close history with uh, Russia quite differently. They see, yeah, well, we're over hundreds of years we lived in the same states, uh, on the same government, we have the same history. So, uh, so they say, you know, we're, we're a country with two ethnicities, two cultures, two languages, and for so for them, uh, nation building would mean you know finding some form of sovereignty. Uh, uh, but avoiding this ethno-nationalism from the West. And, mm. and this has been the key problem. They have to, East and Western Ukraine, they have to find some kind of a balance. Uh, uh, you know, the commonality would be both sides would uh, support sovereign borders. So this is our country. We we, we, we try to organize uh, our differences within it. Uh, but the problem was, this was always very fragile. And uh, not only was Ukraine divided, but they're also in a divided Europe because now the Europeans are literally telling them you have to choose us or them. And uh, again, this is not empty talk. This was uh, actually in 2013 at the end when the Western countries were inciting riots in Ukraine because they wanted them to choose between us or them. And then they made the wrong choice. Uh, the Ukrainians and Russians actually proposed, can we have a trilateral agreement? Uh, so they don't, they can be, a Ukraine, Ukraine can be a bridge. They don't have to choose between us or them. The Europeans uh, said clearly, no, uh, Ukraine has to choose. And of course, when they didn't choose correctly, uh, they instigated a coup. So it's uh, it's quite dramatic. And it, as, as you pointed out, I don't think that the, the democratic argument doesn't come out clearly here because it wasn't supported by the Ukrainians, what, what we did to Ukraine, uh, dismantling it. 
and its democracy. Meanwhile, the Russians could claim some moral superiority because what they wanted, uh, they essentially supported the Eastern uh, Ukrainians. What, what they said, listen, we can join all the Western institutions as long as the Russians join as well. And this was great for Russia because they were favorable to having a greater Europe. So they didn't, they didn't mind, they didn't demand exclusive influence of Ukraine. They just mentioned you, we can't divide, we can't put new dividing lines between Ukraine and Russia. That will create civil war and the conflict with Russia. So this can't be done. Again, this is what the CIA director of uh, in the United States said as well. So it shouldn't be uh, controversial. Uh, and this brings us to the, the other key thing, because um, I mean, the obvious question is why the, why the West just couldn't leave Ukraine alone. I mean, if it had been left alone, it probably would at some point have found its internal balance, but they couldn't leave it alone. And it, it seems to me that this is where, again, um, your conceptual, your intellectual framework helps us to understand why in the end they couldn't leave it alone. Because on the one hand, leaving it alone violates the sort of hegemonic philosophical mindset. You have to have people who are going to be like us. You have to go in and teach these people and model them and shape them to be like yourself. But at the same time, as well as that, there is the great, there is the power, great power, hegemonic um, aspect. You can't have the Russians in because they're too strong and they might disrupt the system, the hegemonic system at its core. So you can't have them in NATO. You can't have them in the EU. You've got to exclude them. And you've got to weaken them. And how do you weaken them? You do that by detaching Ukraine from them and by establishing this anti-Russian Ukraine on their western border and you extend NATO eastwards. Uh, and and you say, so it's in effect looking at this. Well, obviously, there were choices which could have been made and the wrong choices were consistently made in terms of Ukraine and preserving peace. But you can understand a lot better why those wrong choices were made. Because on the one hand, you need to preserve your dominant position, and that means weakening Russia. At the same time, you have to reaffirm the liberal ascendancy, and that means that you have to reshape Ukraine. Yeah, that's. I guess that's another parallel from the 19th century, because uh, if you look at the diplomatic cables from uh, the French and the British uh, during the Crimean War uh, in the mid-19th century, the, 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 the main logic behind it was, you know, we're going to defeat the Russians in Crimea, and that will push them not just out of the Black Sea, but uh, that will push them out of Europe. They will push them into Asia, uh, you know, kind of where they belong, out of European affairs. And uh, this is, um, if you read some of the main uh, strategists who write about uh, the post-Cold War order, the hegemony, for example, Spigniew Brzezinski, uh, yeah, the famous American advisor, he, he, you know, he, he, he very clearly outlined the role of Ukraine in this. If, uh, if you can detach Ukraine from Russia, Russia will no longer be a European power. It will be a nation power. So this is a way of detaching Russia from the continent. So not that much has changed. We were still, uh, it's the same discussion. It's the same logic. Uh, the only difference uh, this, this time, of course, is once you push Russia into Asia in the past, it wasn't economically backward area they will it would ensure that russia could never be uh, a challenge it would be economically backward it would uh, end up in no man's land now of course we do the same we push russia into the largest uh, economy in the world in terms of purchasing yeah. power parity so it's a very it's a very different uh, a, a, a different uh, yeah out, outcome this time absolutely now I, I was thinking about this because in some ways it shows how obsolete and backward-looking Western thinking has become, because um, they always say that the Russians are using 19th-century me methods and concepts um, in, you know, in Ukraine. In fact, it is the West that is. <laughs> They're looking at things, um, assuming that Russia can only prosper if it is somehow connected to Europe. So, if you can push the Russians away from Europe. Well, they'll stagnate and decline, which is really what you want, because 
as they're too big and they're too strong otherwise to absorb into the system and they might always challenge it. Whereas, of course, what you're actually doing now is you're pushing them or trying to push them away from Europe. The risk is that they will become stronger, but of course, your real rivals around the world who are outside the European and Western system will become stronger as well because they will have Russia joining them. And nobody seems to have worked this or thought this through properly in the West, uh, especially in the United States. They cling to these, you know, it's, it is, uh, Jeffrey Sachs talks about this, you know, that, you know, they're refighting the Crimean War of the 1850s. <laughs> and it is all about the Black Sea, by the way, what you said, because I, I, I read a piece recently by the Institute for the Study of War talking about the importance of controlling the Black Sea and depriving the Russians today of control of the Black Sea. So they're saying that now. They were saying that then. And obviously the Black Sea is very important, existentially important for Russia. But it still doesn't really grasp the nature of the modern world, the extent to which it has changed and already slipped away. And that is where this point about the new Eurasian world order comes in, and which you discuss so well in your book. Yeah, this is it. Uh, the world doesn't end anymore uh, at the Black Sea. This is uh, where civilization ends. Uh, and uh, it's, it's funny because the, the Russians also, the, the rhetoric about power shifting, you also see the the, um, the the discourse changing uh, that you know the this whole idea that uh, the civilized there in the west and uh, is not in the east this is a whole mentality that uh, is quite backwards and they they said you know hey, we, we have to shed this uh well they they argue that they have shed it but um but but no i i think this is why ukraine is so important in this point in time because it's a uh, uh, not only was the war sparked to a large extent about the the competition for world order, because the, the, as uh, countless American leaders uh, very explicitly keep saying, but it doesn't end up in our media, is you know if we can break Russia, then we would severely weaken uh, the Chinese as well. They would lose their most important partner, and also that would be a clear signal. And this would you know revive unipolarity. And uh, as the Polish uh, president said, in contrast, if the Russians would win this, it would be the end of the golden era of. Uh, of uh, of American hegemony, and uh, you know, a whole new world will be born. So they all recognized that this was uh, one of the key motivations for going after Ukraine to to yeah to knock the Russians down. Uh, but but also the outcome of this. Uh, look 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 what has uh, what has happened. I think we lived in our own world. You know that Russia is just this gas station masquerading as a country. Oh, they have the GDP of Spain. You know all all, the, all this nonsense. Uh, but but look what happened. Uh, we sent all our weapons. Can't defeat it on the battlefield. All these sanctions. Uh, the economy is growing. Russia is now the largest economy in Europe, and we want to isolate them in the world. Also didn't work. The rest of the world say they didn't want uh, to have anything to do with this. And um, and I, in, in the book, I cite the Singaporean diplomat who was a former president of the United Nations Security Council, uh, Kishore. Um, I'm slaughtering his name now. Uh, yeah. Uh, Mo Mobubani, uh, yeah, yeah so, uh, <laughs> so much for my, yeah. Anyway, so and his his main point was, you know, the the rest of the world they refused to join in on the sanctions and also NATO's anti. Uh, American, sorry, uh, the West's uh, anti-Russian crusade, uh, not because they supported the invasion of Ukraine, because uh, you know, more or less none, none have. Uh, but they, but he, he used a very interesting word. He said, "Can can anyone imagine how obnoxious uh, the Americans and the West would become if they could defeat the Russians?" Imagine that, try, attempting to restore unipolarity, reliving the '90s. Nobody wants this. You know, even the allies of America doesn't want this. The Indians, the Turks, uh, the Saudis, they want to be able to diversify their economic connectivity. Because as long as it's one center of power, uh, they will uh, dominate to, too heavily over them. So this is, uh, you know, all these countries now, lo look at them. They can, you know, uh, trade with the Russians, Chinese, Americans, and they don't want to choose one camp over the other. They just want to be able to trade with everyone. Now no one can tell them what to do anymore. If anyone pressures them too much, then they just shift their economy to someone else. Uh, so, it, you know, they don't want to live in this unipolar world. And uh, I think 
because in the West we, we only see the Ukraine war as uh, being a Russian-Ukrainian war, which is absurd, especially now that we learn how deeply involved uh, the West has been from day one. Um, we, we, we can't understand why, why the rest of the world wants nothing to do with this. You know, why is it that they don't support invasion, but under no circumstance will they support any sanctions against Russia? We can't explain it unless we address the wider issue. Absolutely, because what we're basically saying is that we want to send all of these people who have grown up and become strong, we want to send them back to school and the school where we are the teacher. And of course, you know, you can't expect people to want that. They're tired of our lessons. In fact, they uh, have also come to realize that the teacher is extremely self-serving and uh, um, doesn't apply to, to himself the same rules that, uh, uh, and lessons that he's teaching to the, to the students. So, of course, they don't want to go back. And it is completely unsurprising. Anybody who understands human psychology and, you know, the pride countries have in themselves and people have in themselves would not find it difficult to understand. Can I just mention that one of the most interesting things for people who read the book are the very, very many citations you provide. It is full of the quotes, especially of Western officials, and they are eye-opening. I mean, the the hubris and arrogance and cynicism, um, and I have to use that word cynicism because it's about all the, you know, the idealism that is spoken there. There is always this cynicism as well. It is, is just astonishing. And very, very disturbing. And I have to say, you know, it it would be it will it will be food for the historians. And if ever anybody were ever said, you know, held to account for this, I mean they their words condemn them. Um it it's astonishing how often and how repeatedly the mask drops in some of the things they say. And you know, their own words condemn them. And you can find all those words in your book. Yeah, that's why I, I know it was very heavy on the, the citations and references, but I think because this was the topic, it's it's necessary. Before you mentioned, uh, you know, for example, the, the Black Sea being largely, uh, that the war is largely about control over the Black Sea. I mentioned that on, um, on a Norwegian news channel, and I was condemned for conspiracy theories. And then two weeks later, the deputy secretary general NATO, he goes out and he says the same thing. And then it's OK. So it's just that uh, I think the problem is that this war has become so heavily propagandized from day one. So um, so it's, it's, it's very important to be able to document everything very clearly. Uh, you know, because we say, oh, well, this war didn't have anything to do with NATO expansion, but then you can go all the way, look, you know, Russia's not worried about NATO expansion, but you can go all the way from Bill Clinton to foreign ministers, uh, defense ministers, CIA directors, all these American leaders, uh, top ones, if pro were, you know, cautious about NATO expansion, those who were very favorable of it, like Madeleine Albright, very favorable, but she still recognized, well, of course, the Russian sees this as an encirclement and betrayal. You know, this was common sense. Uh, uh, but 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 still, uh, we were not allowed to discuss this now because it's interpreted as legitimizing Russia, which is apparently the worst crime you can do. Uh, but uh, but it's also yeah across the board. And also the uh, the idea I also mentioned once that uh, Americans have con established complete con uh, established a lot of control over Russia. Uh, sorry, after uh, over Ukraine after the coup, but. Uh, you know, there's an abundance of evidence. They even put in all their own people. Uh, I don't think people noticed, but the, after 2014, the, you know, the finance minister was an American working uh, for the U.S. Uh, uh, State Department. Even in the embassy, American embassy in Kiev, she just took over that post as becoming finance finance minister. So it's colonial. And you had all these other positions of Americans, uh, state prosecutors go for, in New York, going and doing the same for Ukraine. And, uh, and that's why I think everyone's familiar with this um, Viktor Shokin, the general prosecutor of Ukraine. Him as well is giving interviews later on saying that, you know, they came in, they ran us like a colony. They would determine every uh, new employee, employment of a, um, of a key government official had to be approved by the Americans, if the Americans didn't put forward their own people. And, uh, and you know, they said this, uh, they saw us as a colony. Uh, again, nothing to do with democracy. And then 
he was fired himself by Joe Biden bragging about it uh, after he opened a, a criminal investigation after his son over the Burisma. So it's just, uh, you know, if, if you just make a claim, I think people, it's very important in this case to substantiate it. So I guess that's why there's so much, uh, so many citations. And always I try to focus on the Western ones because uh, so far, you know, ev everyone can be dismissed as a Putinist these days if you say the wrong thing. So mm. I like to lean into, you know, Washington Post, New York Times, uh, you know, the Russophobic ones, if you will. Uh, I, and again, if you come back to NATO expansion, and this is where the citations are so interesting, the quotations from these. It's so interesting is that, as you correctly said, they understood, I mean, the, this mythology that the Russians were never promised that NATO would not expand eastwards. Well, it turns out that everybody knew, <laughs> everybody knew that that promise had been made. And there was a deliberate intention, essentially, as far as I could see, not to keep it. And there were all these warnings, it will result in a conflict with the Russians. And as you correctly said, people like Madeleine Albright, all of these people, they accept that it will lead to a conflict with the Russians. And then at the same time, they say, we need to expand NATO in order to provide insurance in case there is a conflict with the Russians. And whilst recognizing that it was the expansion of NATO that was creating the conflict with the Russians in the first place. It, it, it is most strange behavior, very strange behavior. But of course, again, one which makes complete sense if you understand the hegemonic framework in which everything takes place, that the need to preserve and prolong the hegemonic position, first of the United States and then of the West. Yeah, that's why, well, again, this is why I find it so 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 difficult to have any discussions this is because if you say well well once you start to expand nato you you revived the cold war logic of uh, of uh, you know moving dividing lines us or them this zero sum game of the cold war but these days ah oh, that's just a russian mentality but bill clinton he made this argument in january of 1994 when he, when he said, listen, if we expand NATO, we're going to risk uh, redividing the logic of the Cold War. Uh, we're going to go back to block politics, uh, uh, us versus them. European integra integration effect will become this zero-sum game. Uh, everyone said this, uh, George Kennan. Uh, and also, I think the best quote is probably from William Perry, who was the U.S. Uh, defense secretary under Clinton from uh, under Clinton yeah, from ninety four to ninety seven, and it's not just was he strongly against it and considered uh, quitting, but he also explained the the position of all his colleagues who were for expanding NATO. You know, he didn't even reject they they didn't reject the idea that this would be a threat to Russia, but uh, their main position was well, you know, who cares? they Russia's weak. No one cares about Russia. Uh, they're they're you know they. They're going to go into the dustbin of history. They're going to follow the path of the Soviet Union. Who cares? We're going to manage their decline. Let's expand NATO. That would ensure the decline as well. Everything is fine. And anyways, if they one day becomes uh, uh, resentful, uh, at least we have a huge NATO <laughs> surrounded uh, them. So it's it's just the, the fact that we for decide to forget this. It's uh, for me. It's uh, it's quite obscene. And I also quote uh, Joe Biden in there just to show what was coming because in 97 he gave this speech at the atlantic council where he makes fun of russia oh they told me that uh, this is going to be a huge uh, threat for them and if we do this they're going to have to they're not going to be able to integrate with the, the west anymore they're going to have to look to the east to china and he mocks them saying yeah sure go to china haha <laughs> well, that uh, the, you know that country doesn't have an economy this is no point and how about it if you're going to go east why don't you go to iran you know all this mocking and now of course we see it uh, <laughs> uh 25 years or to, well more than that late later and we see uh, yeah these are the main strategic partners now russia their their main most important partner is china and you see them linking themselves closer to iran which is very much overlooked by most countries how important this relationship actually is Absolutely. And in fact, let's come to that, because um, it's very interesting that you talk about Cold War politics, block politics, because in fact, it's again, it's very clear reading your book 
that it is the West that's obsessed with block politics. It's the West that's always creating divisions and uh, uh, instigating conflicts and saying, you know, this is this is your friend, this is your enemy. You've got to make alliances with, um, you know, someone else because, you know, we've got to make alliances with us to protect you from so-and-so. So Pakistan, you must be hostile to India. India, you must be hostile to China, that kind of thing. And you create so conflicts everywhere and and try to extend alliances everywhere. And then you have the opposite model, which is the new model that the Eurasians are creating, which is radically different. It says, no, we don't have blocks. We don't have alliances. We don't have alliances even with each other because we understand that an alliance is defined ultimately by its opponents, by its enemies. And we're not looking for enemies. We're all looking to work together. And I find that, again, an absolutely fascinating part of your book because you see how the Chinese are very careful that, you know, they're setting up all these systems, but they're actually willing to accept constraints upon themselves to reassure people that they're not going to dominate whatever structures are created and abuse them in their own interests. So Russia, India are able to forge connections with each other. The Indians won't want to be subservient to the Americans. They have problems with the Chinese, so they look to the Russians instead. It, it, it's a fascinating thing, and all of it tying together. Yeah, well, this is why I also had that introductory chapter on uh, on the the theories and ideas behind the world order because uh, this was a foundational idea of the Westphalian system was not just a balance of power but also the agreement to maintaining the status quo. So, for example, when Napoleon had been defeated, uh, we didn't create an alliance to perpetuate their weakness uh, to dominate them. No, they were invited in at the Council of Europe, uh, in which they had a seat at the table because uh, the point wasn't to keep them weak; it was to 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 yeah restore and maintain the system and we used to it's not that long ago we rejected the idea keep in mind that a lot of the lessons the eu supposedly had after world war ii was you know we have to have security with each other not uh you know security with other members not against non-members which is why you know the germans french were all supposed to be in the same club but after the Cold War, that changed. Now it's not security with each other, with other members. It's security against non-members. All the rhetoric shifted. And this is the alliance systems you see. This is why, you know, in, in Europe, we split, America split us into, you know, the European versus the Russians. So, or in, uh, in the Middle East, you have the Arabs versus the Iranians. In Asia, they always try to put the Chinese their neighbors against them. Of course, the big trophy would be if they're able to win over the Indians, which is why they get so excited every time there's tensions between the Indians and the Chinese, because now you can also divide them into a dependent ally versus a weakened adversary. But, uh, but no, you're right. And I think, uh, uh, you know, one shouldn't glorify everything that uh, China does, uh, but, but, but one, or, 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 you know, one shouldn't be blinded either that something might be deceptive. But but look at the BRICS expansion, for example. They took, mm. uh, you know, Ethiopia and Egypt. You know, they're having a rivalry over the water canals. Uh, they took in the Saudis, uh, United Arab Emirates and Iran. Uh, these are also adversaries. So it becomes an institutional format for resolving differences between members, not an alliance against others. No one thinks Saudi Arabia and Iran are going to ally up and attack, you know, Britain. It's just that this is not in the cards. It wouldn't work. And uh, I think uh, the Shanghai Corporation Organization is the same. Um, you know, they took on more and more economic competencies. The, this is concerning for the Russians because used to military focused. And then, of course, uh, Russia would be the kingpin. Once it became an economic institution, uh, they thought, okay, now the Chinese might lead, and the, the Russians made them peace with it. They, they can be the leader, but they don't want Chinese dominance. They don't want the new hegemon. So they expanded the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, but if they took in India and Pakistan, if you have that uh, little uh, trio of China, India, and Pakistan, this is a very difficult partnership. But again, uh, if the purpose is to resolve differences between each other, then you can have mutual gain. Everyone uh, improves their economic connectivity, uh, reduce uh, everything of military conflict. And uh, I think this is why it creates incentives for peace as well, uh, which is why I wrote about the, the peace agreement they made between the Saudis and the Iranians. It's in their interest. Uh, the Americans would never do this. They, they 
they paying the price now. You know, they can't get the Saudis to join in on bombing Yemen. The Arab Emirates are putting restrictions on them to attack uh, Iranian proxies or proxies or allies. Uh, so it's um, it's a very different system the Chinese are advancing. It is it is beyond America's conceptual understanding. The idea of bringing together in a group countries that are rivals in the in that kind of way to the American mind it weakens the group because of course they think of it as an alliance and the creation of a block. So you're creating divisions within your block. So that's why you have to exclude. You have to pick one side and exclude the other. But of course. The Eurasians don't think in that way because they're not creating a block. And that, I think, is the fundamental difference. That's something which, is, which the Americans don't understand. What the, what the Eurasians, this is, I'm taking it from your book, are creating is a global Westphalian community in which people balance each other and maintain peace with each other and at the same time prosper and feel secure alongside each other. It's a very different conception of statecraft, and one which hegemonic thinking just cannot possibly get his mind round. No, oh, I think, uh, well, that's why I always think back at this uh, quote of George Kennan, because he was the you know, seen as the architect of the containment policy against the Soviet Union. And, you know, after the Cold War, he's so disillusioned because, you know, so how, how did it come down to this? The Cold War is over. The Russians walked away from an empire. Uh, their main priority is to have peace with us and to work with us. And the, the, he called it political midgets, I think, because the, the only political imagination we had was to let's revive the blocks, you know, who should be in NATO, who should be left outside, that this was the scope, this was the uh, yeah, intellectual imagination that we had, that this was the only way to organize security, was, uh, you know, who should be with us, who's against, and uh, how, how should we organize these power structures. And uh, and again, for the Russian Eurasianists of the 1920s, they saw this as being uh, symptomatic of, uh, of maritime powers, because if you're going to rule from the periphery, then usually you have to keep the big players uh, split. You know, you don't want the Turks and the Russians getting too close or the Iranians and the Turks or the Russians and the Germans, and the Chinese and the Russians, yeah, so, so forth. Uh, you want to keep them divided. But what you see on, on the Eurasian landmass, um, it, it, it doesn't work. Because uh, if, if you're going to have uh, economic connectivity there, uh, you know, not, not only maritime corridors, then you have to be able to work together. And, uh, and and I think this is what you see as well. The, it's not that necessarily the Chinese are more moral than anyone else, but they see that, you know, if they're going to try to do a hegemonic approach to, well, perhaps they're more moral with, you know, maybe it's Confucian ideals, I don't know. But uh, anyways, it's, if, if they would try to become a hegemon in Eurasia, uh, the Russians would then start to lean more towards India. They would lean more towards Iran, maybe Europe. They would start to 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 shift so they realize that if they want to have this Eurasian project of integrating with common technologies institutions uh, uh yeah industries transportation corridors currencies banks all of this then they have to compromise and harmonize how else can we explain why our analysis always go wrong well, like we assumed that the russians and chinese were going to have a huge conflict in central asia it didn't happen because they found a way of accommodating each other mm. and i think this is why yeah, there's a lot of potential, and but again, when whenever I say this Eurasian integration has potential, uh, I, I in the West people say, well, wait, are you su supporting this block against our block? But mm -hmm. you know, in their Eurasian conception, Europe is a part of this. Uh, yeah. You know, the same even the Americans, they Eurasia doesn't have to be against America. It's a it's a multipolar construct. It's anti-hegemonic, not anti-American. So it's not choosing one side over the other. And I think uh, it's. Um, yeah, it's a healthier approach uh, to how I, to organize the world. Both, both Xi Jinping and Putin have both gone out of their way to say repeatedly that the Eurasian project is not an anti-Western project. It, it perhaps to some extent protects people from the West, but it is not hostile to the West. And I, I, there was this there was this phrase that you you gave that you know it's. It's not against, it, 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 it's not an against someone. It's a positive between the countries that are 
forging it together. And it's a Westphalian system, coming back again to what you said, because there's, there's rules and there's which people observe. It's not a situation where the rules are just made at, in a completely arbitrary way by somebody, a centre, which is not itself subject to them, which is what the rules-based international order is. Now, there's a lot of other things in your book, and I think that, you know, it's perhaps best if people read it. But, I mean, there were some very interesting points you made about how universal empires have declined basically coded in their DNA that universalism, after a brief period, relatively brief period of prosperity, leads ultimately to atrophy and stagnation. And um, how that's also happened to liberalism in the kind of way that the liberalism, liberal ideology um, in the West, the, the, the focus on individualism, which was a vital and, you know, humanizing thing at one point has now taken all sorts of very strange <laughs> courses and I, I again i have to say i found that all very interesting um living in britain of course where um one still sees in fact one sees very strongly the symptoms the consequences of stagnation and atrophy that developed and which we've not broken from broken away from during our sort of late imperial phase um and it explains to Americans, that part of your book, I think, explains a very great deal to Americans about the problems within their own country, the economic problems that we're hearing so much about, but also the intense partisan divisions that are there. And it's fascinating that this, you know, this one book is able to bring all of these things together and show that all of these things are connected to each other. Well, uh, on the topic of yeah, the, the universal state or the, the challenges of liberalism facing, this was, uh, I borrowed some of these ideas from uh, John Hurst. He was, a, he was the scholar who termed the coin, well, coined the term uh, security dilemma. He wrote in the 1940s that the, when you have these uh, ideals of, uh, he called it idealist universalism. So he put the French revolutionaries, the Bolsheviks, but I added, uh, well, this was in the 40s, so I added the liberal democracies of our present time into this concept of the idealist internationalism because he, and he made the point that once, once these ideals win, in victory they die. He wrote, and, and I thought that was also a good description of how what happens to to the uh, to to liberalism, because liberalism is often it often thrives in opposition because it's a ideology of freedom of, of the individual. But once it becomes a dominant ideology, uh, and there's no alternative to balance it, uh, everything has to be liberated. So you have to liberate the individual from the from uh, the common culture, from the faith, from from the nation itself. So you have now liberalism divorcing itself from the nation state. It's, a, it's quite a dramatic uh, mm. way. So this is why it become, I think many people now see liberalism becoming, entering a revolutionary stage where we even attempt to lib uh, free ourselves of our own past. You know, it's burdened with all our, the sins of our past. And now we're all going to start living in the area zero again. And it's uh, it's very destructive at its core. And uh, But again, we, we don't have these discussions because if you, if you comment on... Uh, the challenges of liberalism, then, well, either you're for or against. Everything is black or and white in the discourse, so it's very difficult to approach it. And here again, you discuss very, very well, uh, brilliantly, I think, the, the need to control discourse. <laughs> you have to control discourse to protect all of these things, the, the foreign policy, the many contradictions, the, you have, you, the, the various statements that you catalogue so well in your book. You can't talk about them. You can't talk about what happened. So you have to control. <laughs> you have to control what is said and, and the information that is circulated. So... In order to protect all of these things, you have to sort of suppress and control and censor in a way that is the opposite of what Western societies and democracies and liberal democracies used to be all about. 
But I think that's why you also see now unipolarity coming to an end. Uh, everyone recognizes not just the distribution of power in terms of military and economics, but look at how we exercise our ideals. So we spread democracy by toppling democracies. I mean, this uh, um, in, in terms of economic liberalism, you see the liberalism today is becoming more and more illiberal, I would argue. And uh, even economic liberalism, uh, now that the economic concentration is no longer in the West, if you have complete free competition and, you know, the Chinese are leading in key technologies, be it 5G or mm -hmm. anything else, then, of course, this is not favorable to us anymore. So now we're reverting to the idea of fair trade instead of free trade uh, from the American system. So you have all this... Uh, 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 yeah, you see, idealist, uh, the liberal hegemony, it's not just the hegemony is disappearing, but the liberal core of it's going away as well. And as we said, uh, controlling the narrative, uh, only 10 years ago, it would be unthinkable to have this amount of censorship and yeah. uh, cancellations, as they're called, or content moderation. You know, we're inventing new new language to, <laughs> to, 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 to justify why, why we can't have, uh, you know, liberal economics or free speech, or uh, it's, uh, it's quite a... Um, uh, yeah, a, a difficult, uh, a strange time we live in. Even in this country, we, yeah, we have a, um, we have a liberal. Uh, yeah, we have a human rights organizations financed by the states who are now looking to censor people who criticize us. You know, the glory of NATO. It's it's just a, it's it's a very absurd time to be alive, to be honest. And I think this is why I see the decline of uh, liberal uh, and hegemony. Absolutely, and of course, and you know. And as we now come to the end of this program, can I just say, we are at the end. I mean, what we are talking about is unsustainable. And that is absolutely clear to me from reading your book. And you you say, and this is the most, this is always the most important, but perhaps the most disturbing chapter as well, that um, whatever happens now in the war in Ukraine, um, it's already gone horribly wrong. But the unipolar system cannot be recreated. And you talk about how we have a choice. Either we escalate in a disastrous attempt to try and hold things together and pursue it, or we just recognize this fact. And Europe in particular makes some important decisions, which it's been avoiding making recently. Either we do that or we risk a great tragedy. No, I couldn't agree more, and I think uh, uh, this is why it's it's so dangerous. Uh, if we had more yeah. uh, political imagination to yeah. to imagine what other alternatives we could have, because so far it appears our only goal is to revive the 1990s, which are already which is already lost. I mean, best case we severely were able to weaken Russia, but much like in the 19th century between the British and the Russians, uh, it's at the periphery you will see new powers coming, be it India or China, who are or, you know who are you know the new Germany and America who are not going to uh, live by this. Uh, uh, live under this uh, unipolar system uh, anymore anyways so uh the, yeah the world is coming uh, changing very fast and uh the, there should be some discussions uh which is why you and i we talked to jeffrey sachs before and uh, we discussed this uh ideas of um what's this of, of, of adam smith where he also points this out uh, that uh, in his days uh you know discovery of america and in the east indies that this was uh the greatest uh in, he called it the greatest uh, discovery in uh, human history because it connected the whole world. But he also recognized there was a, a huge tragedy for all the peoples the Europeans uh, encountered, simply because the disparity of power was too great. Too much power was contrary in the West. All the relationships, be it economic, military, or political, all of it would be very exploitative. So, you know, he saw it as beneficial if in the future there would be more symmetry in relations. So uh, that's why I'm, I keep making the point that, uh, uh, this uh, Eurasian multipolarity emerging. It doesn't have to be uh, utopia. It's going to have its own set of problems. Uh, but it doesn't have to be seen as uh, being the end of the world. It's just the end of unipolarity. But unipolarity was always unsustainable. So uh, yeah, I wish there was a broader discourse uh, instead of just uh, who's supporting us and who's the enemies. And yeah, that's part of the objective of the book, of course. Well, exactly. I was going to say, Professor Professor Deason, you've made a major step in opening up that discourse. I would strongly recommend everybody to read that book. If you want to understand the world we're in today, I think it is an essential book, actually. 
you you get also by the I mean there's an awful lot there that we haven't discussed in this program. You get a very sen strong sense of some of the personalities also, by the way, who've been involved and have made these kind of decisions. And you it's just, it it weaves it all in the great pattern of history. And of course, if you know anything about history, you know that it doesn't end. It it continues. So there's the end of history ideas, which you also discussed, but you know, we'll leave that for people to read in your book. End of history ideas are are flawed and wrong from the outset. Um, I, I, I think we can both agree on that. So go to read the book. Please do read the book. You'll understand the modern world and why we are in this conflict now. And you'll understand the place of this tragedy, of this terrible war in Ukraine better once you've read it. And as I said, you can find it on Amazon. Hard copies are now on sale. And uh, I think it's an essential and extremely good read, by the way. As I said, I found once I started it, I couldn't stop. So thank you, Professor Deason. If there's anything last that you want to say? Uh, no, not really. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, and uh, <laughs> um... Yeah, hopefully, yeah, people will uh, take an interest in the book. And uh, as you mentioned, um, I think it was Mark Twain. You know, he said, "Yeah, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes." And I think yeah. this is uh, kind of why I wanted the historical perspective of world order because you see the same issues replaying themselves, but slightly different as uh, you know, new ideas, uh, economic systems uh, come into place. So, thank you very much. Thank you.